This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I've been podcasting now for about three years, wanting to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be interested in psychological and emotional issues, maybe you're even in therapy, to those of you who've been initially diagnosed with anxiety or depression or having relationship problems that are formidable, and you're looking for answers, and to a third group that may not even darken the door of a therapist, wouldn't even consider it necessarily, but is just curious enough to listen to a podcast. So welcome to all three of you. This is the second in a series of podcasts that I'm doing about aspects of depression that I don't think are talked about too often. In the last episode, we talked about Beliefs that can lead to incredible loneliness, beliefs that you carry around with you and apply to your life that are really not rational all the time. Today, we're talking about both unconditional love, which often gets the thumbs up as the kind of love to have, and conditional love, which is typically when you hear a message that love will be withdrawn if certain expectations aren't followed. But believe it or not, they can also both be used manipulatively. And believe it or not, Love that was strong can be used up or altered permanently. It's so tragic when I hear this has happened. So let's talk about unconditional love and conditional love and see if we can get some clarity. Our listener email, which is a regular feature of self-work, is from a self-defined people pleaser and how she could change that particular pattern. I'm sure a lot of us are people pleasers, so hopefully this will mean something to you as well. Thanks for being here. Sit back and relax, or relax however you're listening, as we talk about unconditional and conditional love. Today, we're talking about unconditional love and love that brings with it conditions, and how healthy boundaries are far different from either kind of love. But this episode is entitled, Can Love Be Used Up? And if you want an answer to that question, the answer sadly is yes. Let's first look at unconditional love. I know people talk a lot about this, the kind of love that is given freely without you really doing anything to earn or deserve it. For lucky children, that's how their parents feel when they're born. I I certainly know that's the way I felt. He was just there and I loved him. I was completely confused what to do with him, but I loved him. There's an article in Psychology Today by a guy named John Amodeo, I want to say, and he stated it well. Children need to be loved without conditions. As they struggle through life, we need to be unendingly patient, taking many deep breaths and offering guidance repeatedly. Embodying a consistently loving, accepting presence, we create a climate for what's called safe attachment. I thought that was beautifully said. And yet... Normal expectations for children form over the years. Your love for them isn't conditional necessarily, but you have expectations. You want your children to learn and grow and behave, whatever that means in your family. But what kids who are being loved unconditionally hear are things like, I may not like what you do, but I'll always love you. This kind of unconditional love I can appreciate Because the people you offer it to don't have to pass every test or situation that might impact you with flying colors. Unconditional love accepts mistakes and vulnerabilities. Parents see the struggles of their children, often very different between their kids. And so they parent those kids differently, managing their expectations based on what each child can actually accomplish. Although there may be a baseline that's true for all the kids and expectations, but you parent uniquely. So later in life, those very adult children begin to see the flaws and vulnerabilities of the parents that raise them, and they begin to understand that although each parent had strengths, their parents also made normal mistakes, but they don't end their love for them. It just adds a different layer to the picture. They were given unconditional love, and they return it. Healthy love incorporates disappointment, 
Healthy love recognizes that no one will always meet all your expectations. So how is it that we talk so much about unconditional love when we talk about our partners? You're supposed to love them unconditionally, right? But I think that's a dangerous thing to say to someone. You can somehow weirdly shame yourself for having normal expectations. If you don't have normal expectations, I guess you could say something like, I just want you near me, but then take them however they choose to show up. That's truly a setup for being manipulated or even being abused. You may be inadvertently setting up a situation where you're going to be taken for granted. Love without expectations is more than scary because you're basically not establishing your own boundaries for what's acceptable and what's not. Many of us said vows when we got married, whether they were traditional or you made up your own. Promises, expectations, if you will. They're part and parcel of trust and mutual respect. They're healthy. If you don't have them for your partner or your friends or your loved ones, then something's amiss. Someone is likely giving more than the other. Someone is meeting expectations and someone is not. So we all have normal expectations of one another all the time. No matter who the person is, you have a set of behaviors you think they're going to perform. Just think about it. You have expectations of someone who waits on you at a restaurant. They're going to bring you what you ordered. They're not going to charge you the wrong price. They're going to be fairly pleasant. All expectations. Or let's say you're UPS or mail carrier. They're not going to throw your packages. The company will get your package to you in time. There are and should be boundaries to the expectation that love must be unconditional. And actually, think about it. Really manipulative people can cause you to feel as if you're selfish for having expectations. That's when loving unconditionally can be used against you. You can talk yourself into accepting something less than what you need and want. You can say things like, she's doing the best she can, and maybe that's correct. But how much is too much to alter your own wants and needs? You, of course, alone have to decide that. You have to learn what your own boundaries are. Can you even name the line that you wouldn't let someone else cross without letting them know that they had crossed a boundary? But if someone has the expectations, you'll take what is dished out in the name of unconditional love. That can be very difficult. Excuse after excuse is made, all in the name of unconditional love. Religion can play a role here as well, because your spiritual beliefs can suggest that all should be forgiven or excused. But I want to add that as a therapist, I see the damage with more and more injustice and downright hurt that accepting the unacceptable will do. If your basic wants and needs aren't respected, are ignored over a long period of time, it can eat at your own worth, your own self-esteem. Because you get told, you shouldn't need this from me. I love you unconditionally. Why don't you love me in that way? And, as an aside, this is a tool frequently used by narcissists. All of a sudden, it's your fault that you have normal expectations or boundaries. That's manipulation of your belief in unconditional love. It's sad when I've seen love used up. Even parental love or a child's love for their parent. And sometimes it can happen after you've tried to love unconditionally. Your willingness to be manipulated or lied to or stolen from, for one more family event to be ruined by your parent or your child showing up drunk or having a temper tantrum, can end your sense of loving someone unconditionally. And all of a sudden, you do have expectations, not necessarily conditions, but expectations. And as painful as it can be, For you to draw the line, you decide it has to be drawn, and it should be. In fact, this is one of the hardest situations I've ever seen people have to do, to draw a line and say, I'm not willing to go farther than this, and I need you to do your part. And then you see your parent or your child not be able to do that, and you have to act. You have to say, I'm done. I'm done having the kind of relationship we have been having. Actually, it may be the first time that the other person has to suffer the natural consequences of their actions, and you can pray and hope that that can be a game changer for everyone. But 
it can also sadly lead to what may seem at the time the dissolution of that tie. So one thing that can use love up is the lack of respect for healthy and appropriate expectations when unconditional love is manipulated or when you use the excuse that you should be accepted no matter what you do. You may be loved, but your behavior isn't accepted. Those things are very, very different. So you can love unconditionally, but you can have expectations of what is acceptable. And that's when unconditional love cannot be manipulated. So how is conditional love different from this? Let's define what that is and go from there. If you're conditionally loved, you get the feeling that you won't be loved at all unless you meet the other person's expectations to the letter. However, the tricky thing is that it's harder to see than you might think. These are the kinds of stories I'll hear. First, mom and dad only want the best for me and I'm so lucky. So they said they'd pay for the university. They're both alums and love the school. I kind of wanted to go somewhere else, and it was the same price, but it was a no-go. So here I am. I'm unhappy that I feel ungrateful. In fact, that's what they'll bring up if I ask about transferring, that I'm ungrateful. Here's another story. My girlfriend and I do stuff together a lot, but I notice that if I hang out with my guy friends over the weekend, she'll start being standoffish. She says she's too busy, but there's something else going on, and she won't tell me. But I feel like I've done something wrong. I'm not following some rule I don't even know about. Here's another situation. You know, I wish just one Christmas we could stay home. But Mom expects us every year, without even asking, to come to her house. It feels like if I say no, or that I'd like to host, or even just be with my little family, then I'm rocking the boat way too much. It would hurt her, so I stay silent. And one more. My dad's looking so forward to me joining his law firm, but I'm not sure what kind of law I really want to study. He'll listen to that doubt and then say, well, you know, this is a situation most new lawyers would kill for. You'll be making three figures in the first year. And there's no more discussion. I have his approval if, and only if, I join his firm. That's very obvious. So what is happening here? If you don't meet the specifications of a dad or mom or grandparent or girlfriend or boyfriend, you're somehow given the message you're being selfish or not loving, not appreciative, and you either fear or expect that their love will be held back if you don't exactly follow these expectations. There's no compromise, no real discussion. The expectations are rigid, and what's confusing are often couched in quote-unquote, love. They can tend to happen in families that are very close, so close that relationships with other people are dissuaded or downright not allowed, especially if they're more intimate relationships. And again, all of this is cast in the light of, quote-unquote, love. Independence is not fostered. You becoming your own person, having your own voice, isn't part of the equation. I remember a woman I worked with years ago who was very bitter and hurt. She had nothing to do with her adult children. She didn't understand. She'd loved her grandkids. She'd given them so many presents. She felt confused and totally at a loss. And at first, I could feel and empathize with her grief. However, she also told me a story about her son's last holiday visit after he had not been there for a couple of years. The visit lasted all of 10 minutes. Her son had specifically asked her to not go overboard on presents. She was fairly wealthy and loved to give, but this had been a recurring theme in their conflict. Her lack of respect for his parenting choices, completely justified by her, quote-unquote, caring. She said to me, how could my caring be the wrong thing to do? The presents are an expression of my love. When he and his family arrived and he saw all the presents, he left and took his family with him and she had not seen them or heard from them in over a year. She had presents galore under the tree, not the more modest display he'd requested, and for them, that was the last straw. You can say, certainly, that he's the one being rigid, and maybe that's true, 
However, he had what was for him a simple expectation or agreement with her, and she insisted on her own way. His independence, his voice wasn't being heard. Her condition to give her love was, I will be in charge even with your children. She couldn't imagine his way. She refused to be flexible. She was bitter that he wasn't more appreciative. So she moved on and became friends with a young couple in church who accepted her gifts readily and with gratitude. Again, not a bad thing to do to handle her hurt. But it's sad to hear that neither one of them felt as if they could trust the other. And it ended badly for both. I'm not trying to put a black hat on her or her son. I'm simply saying that certainly he felt loved conditionally. And in her own way, I think she was believing that he was trying to control things as well. And there wasn't compromise between them that both understood and seemed to agree to. So when it didn't happen, they lost trust. Love with conditions can feel like a prison because the person who's setting up the expectation usually gives the message that their love will be withdrawn if you don't play by their rules. Let's talk about another example, a guy named Mark Smith. Mark had learned that pleasing family, being who his parents needed him to be, was paramount. It was expected. He said with a fair amount of irony that his own marriage looked perfect to others. He created what was familiar. But he'd had an affair, and he and his wife were working very hard on reconciling and working on what was wrong between them. He'd even made connections between old resentment and anger that he'd suppressed and his present-day struggle with meeting his wife's reasonable expectations. He'd become at one point suicidal and went into the local crisis intervention program. That wasn't a secret his family knew. But unfortunately, his family seemed to love him more conditionally, and there was an insistence that he not talk about his depression. That wasn't the Smith way. They never asked him about it or his treatment, never even recognized that he'd been suicidal. The rule to be included in the family, the condition was that he be normal, that he never talk about it. Now, that threat was not expressed, but it was sensed. So he knew better than to talk about his struggle. One of his sisters finally asked about his depression. She pulled him aside right before leaving his home and said, that depression thing, you're you're good now, right? For the others, it was as if his depression hadn't happened. To be a smith, you had to look completely put together, in charge, and looking great. Yet it's important to point out again that conditions aren't the same as expectations. If you want your teenager to get a summer job and you tell them that if they don't, there will be some consequence, then those are the natural consequences to them disappointing your expectations or not meeting your expectations. If you tell your partner that if you find out she's using again, that you'll expect her to go into rehab, that's also a natural consequence, an expectation. You're giving the other person information about your boundaries. Now, they may hear it as a threat, but if you give it in a calm voice and with caring, it's a boundary, it's information, and it's expectation. If boundaries are instead established that have nothing to do with appropriate or respectful behavior, that love will be withdrawn if you don't follow the covert or overt rules that someone has for you, then that's conditional love. Let's see how we can summarize. The kind of unconditional love you have for a child is unique. You may feel it for others in your family. You love them because they exist. Yet the expression of unconditional love can be manipulated when there are no stated boundaries. Boundaries don't make love conditional. Boundaries aren't conditions, but they are expectations. Conditional love means that there are overt or covert ways Someone is letting you know that certain behavior is expected from you, and actual love and inclusion will be withdrawn if those wishes aren't followed. And conditions, by definition, are manipulative. Somewhere in the middle is far better, having expectations that are healthy, but welcoming compromise and discussion. Our listener email today, I thought fit very well into this particular episode since it's from a self-defined people pleaser. They say, I recently started listening to your podcast and am finding it very interesting. I myself am taking the first steps to try to understand and improve my own mental health issues. 
I've not been to a therapist yet, but I'm considering this option seriously. But I'm interested in knowing what thoughts and suggestions you would have for someone who's a people pleaser. I've always felt the overwhelming need to please everyone around me. Now as an adult, I've begun to see how this has been a major factor in my feelings of low self-worth, fear of conflict, difficulty sharing my opinions and feelings, and constant need for praise in order to feel good. I often feel resentment toward others who don't praise or compliment me on things I've done, especially when the things were done specifically to please them. As an example, I've been working to redecorate my daughter's bedroom. She's married now and lives in Wyoming, so it's very hard for me to please her like I did when she was young. So I thought that by redecorating her room, I could please her and she would say nice things about my time and effort. However, her reaction has been to question me on why I'm redecorating her room and not any other rooms. This has really hurt me, but of course, I cannot share this with her as it might lead to conflict. Another example is that I really love to sing. I'm a member of my church choir and sing solos on a regular basis, but if no one or very few people compliment me after the service, I feel awful. And what really hurts me is that my own family doesn't compliment me. Even my son, who is a great singer himself and a music teacher, does not offer any praise or positive words unless I ask him for an opinion. And then he says, it was good. I would really like to know your thoughts and suggestions. How can I begin to build my feelings of self-worth without praise and compliments from others? I thought probably a lot of us do this, that we look around to see if someone is going to give us a compliment or something, and when they don't, it's kind of hurtful, especially if we work really hard on something. And maybe others of you don't have this issue, but I imagine there's some of you that do. So here's my answer. I'm so glad you're figuring this out. I've tried to help many others who struggle just like you, never knowing why others don't either reciprocate the nice things they do for them, or they put their worth and value into receiving praise, and lots of it. I think it's normal to want others to appreciate our kindness or generosity or caring. That's not pathological, and occurs in healthy give-and-take relationships. It's possible, of course, that your kids have grown up and are adults who don't give back much. It would be interesting to see if they do it in other situations. However, I think it's good for you to look at your own expectations. After all, that's what you have control over. A woman easily comes to mind who tended to focus on what her daughter and son, who both lived long distance away, had not done instead of what they had. If her daughter called, her response was, I haven't heard from you in so long. Or if she was talking to her son about her latest disappointment in something, he changed the subject. What she didn't realize was how negatively she was thinking. That's a possibility in your case, that maybe you want so much for people to say kind things that you're not paying enough attention to the things they are saying. Also, of course, do you praise yourself? Do you say, that was a good job? I'm really proud that I risked and tried. Good for you. I'm a singer myself, so I know how hard that is. But with the situation with your daughter, I also would wonder how you're handling empty nest itself, not being a hands-on mom anymore. It may be that you have some grief there that you haven't addressed. You may never get to please her the way you did when she was a child. So how do you want to be part of having more of an adult-to-adult relationship with her and then focusing on more of what would make you feel happy or pleased? Maybe her question about the other rooms in the house that hurt you stirred up that grief, that she's moved on and wants you to have your own life apart from her. Another thought comes to mind about your second example, the singing example. I saw a man years ago who had a leadership role in our community where he gave frequent speeches and he'd find himself hanging around after the meeting, needing someone or many someones to tell him how inspiring he'd been. He even baited people a bit by asking them, what do you think about the meeting today? Since people could tell how urgent he was, it made them uncomfortable. He sensed that discomfort, but sometimes couldn't stop himself from asking the question. So he really worked on how he could talk to himself about when he believed he'd done a good job or what he needed to work on, or maybe getting a mentor outside of of the other people around him who could give him objective feedback. Maybe ask someone in the congregation, would you listen to my singing today and let me know what you think, honestly and objectively? That way, if they say, 
boy, it was really good today, or, you know, I didn't quite understand the middle part, you'll get objective feedback. Of course, that's different from just praise, so you have to make sure that's what you really want. But I also want to applaud you for looking so honestly at yourself. Long-distance love can be tough. And learning to give because you want to and not to necessarily receive kudos from others, that's you following your own rules. But again, it's not pathological to value positive feedback from others. It just sounds like you need some other methods of getting feedback that right now you could think of creating. Thanks for such a great question and such vulnerability. I hope that was helpful to many of you who might be a people pleaser yourself. Thanks so much for being here today. I want to invite you to email me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. But there's also another way of leaving me a message now through the SpeakPipe channel. You just leave a message. You've got one and a half minutes to do so. And I'll use it on the podcast itself. I love hearing the questions in your own voice with your own inflection. You can head over to DrMargaretRutherford.com. And there you can subscribe You'll get a weekly newsletter with my blog post for the week and my podcast. It's a great way of just keeping up with the whole thing. And of course, I give you updates and information on things that are going on with me. I also have a closed group. It's facebook.com slash groups slash self work. Would love to have you there. Thank you so much for your ratings and reviews on iTunes. But I'm going to ask you all to do this. I'd love to see this week what happens If I ask you to tell a friend about self-work, I want to see if the numbers go up substantially. I would love to see that. That'd be such fun. So tell a friend. That's the best publicity I can get. Thank you again for being here. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self-Work.